If you please be seated, I think Tony is going to bring the first reading to us. Thank you. Our first reading today is uh, Romans 4. You can find it on page 1131 in the Pew Bibles. Abraham justified by faith. What then should we say that Abraham, our forefather, discovered in this matter? If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, when a man works, his wages are not credited to him as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the man who does not work, but trusts God who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited as righteousness. David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will never count against him. Is this blessedness only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? We have been saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. Under what circumstances was it credited? Was was it after he was circumcised or before? It was not after, but before. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith, while he was still uncircumcised. So then, he is the father of all, who believe but have not been circumcised in order that righteousness might be credited to them. And he is also the father of the circumcised, who not only are circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. It was not through law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who live by the, by the law are heirs, faith has no value, and the promise is worthless, because law brings wrath. And where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, the promise comes by faith, so that it might be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our Father in the sight of God, in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls things that are not as though they were. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. That is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words, it was credited to him, 
were written not for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness. For us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we've made it to chapter 4 of Romans and uh, this series may seem quite long as we go through 14 chapters, one chapter at a time. But uh, as you heard what uh, Tony read, then uh, in this chapter, no less than others, um, you'll have realised that there's a whole lot that could be uh, unpacked and uh, some people have spent years, week by week, working through preaching the book of Romans. And so whatever we do, it's going to be pretty broad brush. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come to your word this morning, we pray that you'll enable us to hear what you want to say to us. For Jesus' sake, amen. So we're making quite good progress getting to chapter 4 with this exposition of uh, the Christian good news by Paul to these churches that he's not yet met in Rome. And we began with Paul's introduction of himself and his unapologetic ownership of the gospel in chapter 1. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And so he launches straight into his apologetic with a devastating expose of the human condition, which takes him through chapter 2 and into chapter 3. And we consider the contemporary unpopularity of the concept of sin in our society, where we prefer to excuse and justify our attitudes and behaviour. But nonetheless, as we were thinking, as we look into the reality of our hearts, Paul's analysis is unavoidable. <clears throat> we are all children of Adam and Eve. We have a fault line running through us like seaside rock. None of us is the person we would really like to be, let alone the person that God created us to be. And so whoever is honest probably admits the truth of this. And by the time we reach Romans chapter 3, verse 23, we find it hard to argue with Paul's summary, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But as Matt expounded to us last week, the, this realistic analysis of our condition before God is bracketed with the amazing good news that God has revealed in Jesus. And he used those three technical terms, redemption, atonement, justification, terms from the slave market, the temple, and the law court, meaning that we can be set free, that we can be put at one with God, that we can be judged not guilty, not because of ourselves, but because of Jesus and what he did for us on the cross. And if you missed it, I do suggest that you listen to that sermon from last week online, or have a look at the home group video, or read Romans chapter 3, or maybe even better still, work it all out for yourself by coming to the Alpha course, as advertised earlier, Tuesday evenings here, began last Tuesday, flyers in the pews. So that's the recap, and sorry I didn't give you the opportunity to take your handset and skip it. So we reach Romans chapter 4 and our reading this morning. When I was a lot younger, my favourite cathedral was uh, 
uh, was Coventry Cathedral. I think it's been supplanted since then, but uh, then it had only just recently been completed. And when, as I did about twice a year, I went to Coventry to inspect the Lions Tea Shop, I also took the opportunity to slip into Coventry Cathedral to, ins to have a look at that. The spacious interior was... One of the things that I found out, sorry, about that spacious interior was that uh, the columns that run along either side of the cathedral are not holding up the roof. If you took them away, it wouldn't make any difference at all. They're part of the design, but the structure doesn't depend on them. Romans chapter 4 is one of those passages that we can find it quite hard to get our heads round because it was written into a situation which is pretty much unfamiliar to us. It's outside our frame of thought. It's all in the context of the question of the necessity for circumcision and the importance of the law. Ni nothing, sorry, needing to be circumcised, I guess, never really comes into our thinking. The arguments about it in the New Testament are interesting history, but don't have a great deal of personal relevance today. And sometimes, similarly, the Old Testament law can seem pretty irrelevant certainly to our salvation. However, I think that's not necessarily quite true. While we do not take much knee, heed to the codes of Leviticus, we don't count women as unclean when they have a period, we're happy to have clothing which mingles all sorts of different fibres, and we're probably happy to eat pork and black pudding but there is an attitude to law which is actually remarkably relevant and prevalent today. If you talk to people about their beliefs, and I've talked to lots of people over my life about their beliefs, they're quite likely to say things like, I don't go to church every week, brackets meaning hardly ever, but I try to live by the Ten Commandments. Or, I follow Jesus' teaching and try to live by the golden rule, do as you would be done by. And they're all attitudes which are summarised by it is what I do that counts in my relationship with God. As Paul looks at Abraham, the father of the Jewish nation, an exemplar of the faith, he is taking away these two great pillars which the Jews relied upon. Pillars which cannot bear the weight of relationship with God. Pillars of circumcision and the law. He's showing that Abraham's relationship with God does not depend upon them. And four times in this chapter, and uh, I meant to mention <coughs> that in this sermon series, though not every time we preach, it's really quite helpful to have the Bible open. And uh, I see one or two of you have got it open on page 1131. And... Uh, it's just an opportunity to check up on what the preacher, preacher is saying and whether you actually agree with what he's getting out of the passage that we're looking at. And four times in Romans chapter 4, in verse 3, verse 5, verse 9, verse 22, he uh, quotes from Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, Abraham believed the Lord and he credited, credited it to him as righteousness. So it's all about this covenant that God made with Abraham. The relationship between God, Abraham and his descendants. It was a covenant made and ratified, says Paul, before either circumcision or the law came into being. 
neither of them was necessary as a factor for the covenant to be effective, for Abraham to have this relationship with God, which was counted to him as righteousness. And if these two do's, be circumcised and keep the law, are taken away, then what's left? What Paul is pointing us, what is Paul pointing us towards? It's there in verse 14. It was not through law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be the heir of the world, but through righteousness that comes by faith. On the one hand is the promise of God, and on the other is receiving the promise. It's not the law or circumcision which links them together. What is it? The answer is faith. And so Paul demonstrates that far from the Old Testament being all about keeping the law and get to get right with God, or being circumcised to get right with God, rather from the earliest days it was about receiving grace by faith. And Paul has a lot more to say about it. He has ten more chapters on the subject. But even here in chapter 4, we've reached the heart of what is Paul's overarching message. In uh, 1966, before we got married, Mary and I spent three weeks going every evening after work to Earl's Court to help with the Billy Graham crusade that was taking place there. I was helping with stewarding, and Mary was helping with the bookstall. And it was a long time ago, and in some senses it was another age. Each evening we saw the big arena packed with people who'd come to hear Billy Graham preach. And every evening, without exception, his talk would end with the words, I want you to get up out of your seat. Night after night, people did just that. Hundreds and hundreds of people responding to that same gospel that Paul expounds in, in Romans. Billy knew that there was a decision to be made, a transfer of personal trust from what I do to what Christ has done for me. And that by getting up out of their seats, People knew they'd made that decision and could look back on it as an event afterwards. As our reading ended, to whom God will credit righteousness, for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he was delivered over to death for our sins and raised to life for our justification. In his letter to the Ephesians, Paul summarized it this way, for it is by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. Paul spends so much time arguing this case because it is of such crucial importance. Not what I can do, but what Christ has done. God's grace in Christ, received by faith, if you like, by getting up out of our seats. I'm not going to ask you to get out of, up out of your seat this morning. Maybe I should. But um, can I just suggest three things that you if you were going to follow up on this line of thought from Paul. First thing would be uh, the possibility of going to the Alpha course, as advertised earlier, leaflets in the pews next Tuesday, 7 o'clock here in the church hall. Just to spend time thinking it through for yourself if you're not absolutely sure what the gospel is and how it relates to your life, how important it might be. Well, secondly, one of the bits of literature that tends to go with the Alpha Course is this booklet by Nicky Gumbel, Why Jesus, which just goes through it all 
in a very brief form and gives you the opportunity at the end to respond. And I'll put one or two at the back after the service. Or maybe to read through the book of Romans and to take to yourself its message. I read this week that it doesn't take more than an hour or so to do if you work your way through it in one sitting. Give it a try. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the ways that Paul finds to express this one gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ dying for us, of his grace expressed on the cross that we can receive by faith. We pray that we may not let it pass by, but that we may recognize it for the life-changing life-enhancing, life-completing message that it is. For Jesus' sake, amen. amen. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty? So much stronger The King of glory The King above all kings Who shakes the whole earth With holy thunder And leaves us breathless In awe and wonder The King of glory The King above all kings King who conquered the grave Worthy is the Lamb